This week, a new year brings new things for the Vatican, and we look at the Pope's Christmas events. Hello and welcome to this first edition of Vatican Connections for 2016. So, what's been going on? Well, we know Pope Francis is unafraid to think outside the box and to reach out and connect with people. Continuing this trend, he will be releasing a video message to the faithful every month. Now, you might know that the Pope releases special prayer intentions every month. Usually, they're published by Vatican Radio and other Vatican media. But now, the Pope is partnering with the Jesuit Apostleship of Prayer. Pope Francis will record the videos in Spanish, and they will be available with subtitles in 10 different languages. The videos will be distributed through social media. And here is the very first papal prayer intention video. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. And there are more changes in the Vatican establishment coming this year. The so-called papal tour director, Alberto Gasbari, is set to retire in 2016. Now, he is already 70 years old and has been organizing papal trips since 1982. The job requires him to make advanced trips to the countries and cities to which Pope Francis wants to travel. So, depending on the Pope's itinerary, that can mean spending a good portion of the year outside of the country. The Italian newspaper La Stampa reports that a Colombian priest will replace Mon uh, Mr. Gasbari. Monsignor Mauricio Rueda Belts is expected to be named to the position. La Stampa says Archbishop Paul Gallagher of the Vatican Secretariat of State revealed the upcoming changes just before Christmas. And finally, the Christmas season is a special time for Catholics. Now imagine on top of that, getting to meet the Pope as part of one of the Christmas liturgies. Well, that is exactly what happened to one family. CNS has more. My name's Linda McCarran, and this is my family. And we had the honor of taking up the offertory to the Holy Father on New Year's Day. I was nervous. I was thinking, this is so surreal. It, is this really happening? I mean, what a, what a privilege and what an honor. I think we probably all felt the same. It's just so overwhelming and joyous that it just brought tears to my eyes, actually. I was just trying not to trip. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was very nervous. He held my hand and he gave me a blessing. And he said I was beautiful. It felt comfortable to be around him. And I think that's, you know, the message that he sends, you know, is, is a simple one of uh, love and peace. And that's what made it feel so great. We were born with Pope Pius XII. And since then, there's been six 
popes. And I never, never, ever dreamed of meeting a pope face to face. What a thrill. It just, it's just unreal. We were lucky enough to both uh, shake hands with John Paul II. My wife had one hand and I had another hand, which was, that was a, a, unbelievable. Moment. Of course, uh, what happened uh, on uh, January 1st was even well beyond that. It's so amazing to see the Holy Father. And to me, it makes me want to be the best Catholic that I could ever be. And that is now my new mantra for 2016. Did you know Pope John Paul II was the first pope to baptize the children of Vatican City employees in the Sistine Chapel on the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord? We're at the tail end of the Christmas season. It's a season full of special liturgies and prayer services and, of course, homilies. So we're going to take a look now at some of those homilies that Pope Francis has delivered over the last few weeks. It all began, of course, on Christmas Eve with the Vigil Mass celebrated by Pope Francis. In his homily, he said the birth of Christ changed everything, and there is no room for dread or doubt. We must follow the path to Bethlehem, the Pope said, and contemplate the face of the child. Let us let him speak to us. Let ourselves be embraced by him and filled with peace. Pope Francis said the child teaches what is truly essential in our lives and trains us to reject godless ways. The child Jesus also calls us to live a simple, balanced, consistent life where we can see and do what is essential. The Mass ended with Pope Francis placing the baby Jesus in the manger at the entrance to St. Peter's Basilica. From there, December 27th is the Feast of the Holy Family, and the Gospel focuses on the Holy Family's pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover. Pope Francis said family life itself is a series of pilgrimages. And the most important thing, though, is that a pilgrimage does not end when one arrives at their destination or the pilgrimage location, but when you return home, go back to normal life, and then have to put into practice everything you've just learned. Pope Francis also said family is a privileged space to experience the joy of forgiveness. On New Year's Eve, while many people were preparing for parties, Pope Francis was leading a Vesper service for the Feast of Mary, Mother of God, with a Te Deum. Now, he said going over the events of the past year can be a simple review of events, or it can be an attempt to see if we have perceived God's presence in our lives. It's also a time to ask if world events unfolded according to God's plan or according to the will of men. He said, days of violence, death, suffering, and people being displaced are countered by signs of goodness and acts of solidarity, but good things don't make the news. Celebrating Mass for the Feast of Mary, Mother of God on New Year's Day, Pope Francis said, the birth of Jesus changed everything. It was the start of a new era. History did not determine his birth but his birth allowed history to attain its fullness. However, the world is filled with negative signs that make us believe he is absent. But the Pope said, a torrent of misery swollen by sin is powerless before an ocean of mercy which floods our world. He told the faithful to immerse themselves in this ocean to overcome the indifference which blocks solidarity. He celebrated a second mass at the Basilica of St. Mary Major, where he opened the Basilica's holy door. CNS has more. E più che mai appropriato che in questo giorno 
Noi invochiamo la Vergine Maria anzitutto come Madre della Misericordia. La Porta Santa che abbiamo aperto è di fatto una porta della Misericordia. Chiunque varca quella soglia è chiamato a immergersi nell'amore misericordioso del Padre, con piena fiducia e senza alcun timore. E può ripartire da questa Basilica con la certezza, con la certezza che avrà accanto a sé la Compagnia di Maria. Lei è Madre della Misericordia perché ha generato nel suo grembo il volto stesso della Divina Misericordia, Gesù, l'Emanuele, la tesso di tutti i popoli, il Principe della Pace. Il Figlio di Dio, fattosi carne per la nostra salvezza, ci ha donato la Sua Madre, che insieme a noi si fa pellegrina per non lasciarci mai soli nel cammino della nostra vita, soprattutto nei momenti di incertezza e di dolore. Now, January 1st is far from the end of the Christmas season. On January 6th, Pope Francis celebrated the Epiphany, and CNS has details. Oggi ci farà bene ripetere la domanda dei Magi. Dov'è colui che è nato, il re dei Giudei? Abbiamo visto spuntare la sua stella e siamo venuti per adorarlo. Siamo sollecitati soprattutto in un periodo come il nostro a porci in ricerca dei segni che Dio offre, sapendo che richiedono il nostro impegno per decifrarli e comprendere così la Sua volontà. Siamo interpellati ad andare a Betlemme per trovare il bambino e sua madre. E una volta giunti davanti a Lui, adoriamolo con tutto il cuore e presentiamogli i nostri doni, la nostra libertà, la nostra intelligenza, il nostro amore. La vera sapienza si nasconde nel volto di questo bambino e qui, nella semplicità di Betlemme, che trova a sintesi la vita della Chiesa. E qui la sorgente di quella luce che attrae a sé ogni persona nel mondo e orienta il cammino dei popoli sulla via della pace. Of course, the Christmas season concludes January 10th with the baptism of the Lord and a special Mass in the Sistine Chapel. Let's take a look now at what else Pope Francis did this week and beyond. So, technically, Pope Francis was on holidays, but on Sunday, he led the Angelus Prayer at St. Peter's. In Europe, that is actually the solemnity of the holy name of Jesus. Pope Francis reflected on the prologue of John's Gospel, saying, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, but people preferred the shadows and closed the door on God. This is the mystery of evil, which takes root in our lives, and he said it requires constant vigilance on our part so that it does not take over. 
Then on Monday, Pope Francis, again, technically had nothing on his schedule, but he's not very good at doing nothing. So Pope Francis took a couple of plainclothes security guards and drove to Greccio, the town just south of Assisi, where um, St. Francis first put together the living nativity scene. The visit to the shrine there was planned at the last minute and was so impromptu, the shrine's guardian was caught off guard and he had to run to the rectory to put on his habit before opening the gate for the Pope. After praying at the shrine that commemorates the first nativity scene, the Pope also stopped in on a local youth meeting that was organized by the diocese. About 150 young people were taking part in that meeting. They were totally surprised when the Pope walked in. Now he reflected on the two main signs of Christmas, the Star of Bethlehem and the baby in the manger. Then on Wednesday, Pope Francis celebrated Mass for the Feast of the Epiphany and also led the Angelus at noon. And later in the week on Thursday, the Pope returned to celebrating morning Mass in the chapel of the Santa Marta residence. The Masses were on hold during the Christmas season. And of course, on Sunday, Pope Francis is scheduled to celebrate the baptism of the Lord by baptizing the babies of Vatican City employees during a special Mass in the Sistine Chapel. Let's look now at the resignations and nominations that have happened recently. So, first up, there were actually two new dioceses created that we have to tell you about. First, in Bangladesh, Pope Francis created the Diocese of Barisal. The territory was taken from the Diocese of Chittagong to create Barisal. The first bishop of the diocese is Lawrence Howlander. He was serving as an auxiliary of Chittagong. Bishop Howlander is a member of the Holy Cross Congregation and was ordained a priest in 1994. Since then, he has served as a parochial vicar, the rector of a seminary, master of novices, and a chaplain for the local Caritas. He was ordained bishop in 2009 and is the president of the Bangladesh Bishops' Commission for Clergy and Religious. The new Diocese of Barisal has more than 29,000 Catholics. Meanwhile, uh, on this side of the world, there is a new diocese in North America. Pope Francis created a Syro Malankara eparchy for the United States and Canada. It is called the St. Mary Queen of Peace eparchy and will be based in Elmont, New York. The bishop for this new diocese is Thomas Nekham Parampil. Now, he has been serving as the Apostolic Exarch for Syro Malankara Catholics in Canada and the U.S. There are about 10,000 Syro Malankara Catholics in North America, and the diocese includes 19 parishes and three women's religious institutions. Well, 2016 promises to be another busy year for the church. There are already papal trips lined up for January and February. The canonization of Mother Teresa is expected in the fall. And the summer brings us yet another edition of World Youth Day. This time it is in Krakow, Poland. And we'll be bringing you regular updates from Krakow about the preparations for World Youth Day 2016. Starting this week, we're looking at why World Youth Day is important and how mercy plays a big role in this year's event. Here is Iago de la Sierra on World Youth Day and mercy. World Youth Day for me is many things. One of the things is it's an incredible experience of meeting young people all around the globe and learning more about their faith, learning more about them, about their challenges in their life. And, uh, and it's also like people in a vocational quest, people looking for the vocation. And this is what makes World Youth Day very special for me, seeing and helping young people to understand what God uh, is looking for them, how God is giving them a special vocation for each one of them. 
Why mercy is important? Because the Pope is asking us to accompany him during this year through the paths of mercy. And sometimes people don't know the church. Sometimes people think that the church is, has a, like a too strong message or too hard message or too unhuman message. So this year I hope this is a, a great opportunity to explain to many people what the church is about, which is a mercy path to happiness. So happiness has nothing to do with food, with music, with great friends. No, it's a part of it. But mainly happiness is being uh, peaceful with yourself. And uh, human beings, men and women, are only in peace with themselves when they are connected to their Creator, with, when we are connected with God. Because God not only created us, but asked us to be happy in connection with Him as very good sons and daughters. So for me, happiness is having a great relationship with God. And because of these relations, been having a very good relationship with other men and women. Divine mercy is it's related to how to you how do you look to other people? How mercy you are, you don't judge people. You just you try to help people. You don't fix your attention in the way they dress or the when they look like with beer or with tattoos or whatever. And you go through that and you see the the real person behind like a facade, and you deal with these people. Uh, divine mercy is also dedicating time to others, not to be self, uh, selfness, uh, selfiness. Um, divine mercy is about dedicating time to, to prayer. Uh, divine, li living divine mercy in your life is also being a good professional, because you, we dedicate a lot of time to to our profession, being a student, a university student, or being a young professional. And uh, it means that we have duties to fulfill. And mercifulness is also about being a good citizen, taking care of social problems. Divine mercy is everywhere. St. John Paul II was, is the founder of World Today. So he had the idea of if young people are not coming to the church, let's go and find them where they, wherever they are. John Paul II has had a great role to play in, in showing the whole church about the divine mercy. Because before his pontificate, not everybody, I mean, divine mer the devotion to divine mercy was more a Polish thing. But in other parts of the world, it was more no, known the devotion to the, the sacred heart of Jesus, which is connected, but it's not the same thing. So it was very good for the whole church to have John Paul II teaching us how important divine mercy was, because it, it's a divine message coming from, 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 coming from God. I have experiences in several World Youth Days, in Santiago, in Paris, in Rome twice, in Madrid. But I'm pretty sure that Krakow will be the best World Youth Day ever. So do not miss this opportunity and join us in July 2016. Well, that's all for this edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time for more of what's going on at the heart of the church. Until then, you can always follow us on Facebook or Twitter or watch us on Roku TV On Demand. From everyone here, thanks for watching and see you next time.